If you can find that, I will marry you. <laughs> it had actually been um, it had actually been pro painted by one of the guys at the Newcastle Games Workshop, and this was round about 1989 to 1990ish, I think. So it would have been a pretty darn nice paint job. Oh, it was a nice paint job. The guys at Newcastle were great. It was back when I was going, when I was about oof, late teens, just hitting 20. And uh, let me think, there were three people who worked there, and all three of them were called Chris. <laughs> which led to some confusion. Although, of course, fortunately there was a big Chris, and a little Chris, and a Chris the manager. Which always makes things easier. Cool. Yeah, and, of course, you know, it helps as well if one has a limp and a big nose. All the other ways you can add a prefix to the word Chris. So you're deliberately picking on my foibles, aren't you? With the big nose and the limb. <laughs> I was known as that one who can't paint Chris. <laughs> well, that's you. I remember I used to turn up every week and buy things from the box of bits. I used to love that box of bits. Okay, so that's the that's the first level of highlights done. Um, we're going to. You can see it's added, added a bit of form already. Um, all we're going to do for the next layer is add a bit more. That sounds good. A bit more sunburst yellow and paint them on a, on a smaller area. So make sure you keep this because you want to keep the uh, keep it in the same shade kind of thing. So there we go. Lovely. And because we've added paint, we need to add a bit more water to make sure it flows. That's, you know, especially if you get into doing um, freehand, you know, all the all the designs and the the glyphs and stuff. Mm. If it doesn't flow, you yeah, it you doesn't be able go. To work with it, really. So again, the same procedure on the upper surfaces, a smaller area than before. I'll just lock in with the camera again. Yeah, it was quite funny, you know, um, remembering some of the Games Workshop tales in the past. And for those of you who think I'm waffling, you know, this video is a lot easier when you have actually got something to listen to as well. Definitely. Especially when you're making it. Um, yeah, I remember Tyranids had literally just came out. That's going around. This is going back quite a long way, and they brought out Space Hulk, the game. And I remember... I think some 1989, 1990 issue game, Red, uh, not Red Dwarf, um, White Dwarf, had, uh, you could come to the shop and play against my friend at the time, Eugene, and they had Eugene's Gene Stealers, however it was advertised as, and uh, if you beat Eugene and his Gene Stealers in Space Hulk, you won uh, a Space Marine, I think, a little Space Marine figure, and it was a great little promo, because those those nids, but those uh, gene stealers were just uh, not nice to play against. No, he <laughs> went hand to hand. They ripped you a new one. I can't remember in um, in that game there was a dreadnought as well, wasn't there? That was uh, Space was that? Crusade. That's Space Crusade, that's right. One of the very early dreadnoughts. Yeah, and that's where that's where we got Necrons from. Was it? If you remember, there were well, I, this is my theory. I don't have a you know a direct line into games workshop themselves, but there used to be. Which is called Chaos Androids. Oh yes. And they look remarkably like. I remember those now. Necrons. I mean, it could be a similarity. I find it. I find it quite an interesting kind of since the Necrons came out round about the time of the Necromonger in that Vin Diesel movie. Yeah. Oh, with the Necromongers. I know that was complete coincidence, but uh, I actually, I'm one of the few people who really enjoyed that movie an awful lot. Which one, the first or the second? Second. Definitely. I, I thought mean... the second one was just a complete romp. It was just fantastic. It, what more could you want? You know, it had chicks, it had guns, it had a space prison, it had mad people in a spaceship, and it had mad zombie robot people. Definitely. definitely. <laughs> Is there anything else you need apart from that? I did find it very. Uh, I, I thought the imagery was very inspired. The by imagery was 40K. fantastic. I'd say so myself. I would have said so personally. The film, to be quite honest, looked to me like it may as well have been ripped from the pages of 40k. Yeah. A bit, and I was surprised that more people didn't kind of say so. Well, Games Workshop have this uh, have this reputation where God they, bless their very kindly soul. Yeah, the, apparently Games Workshop have never done anything original. I remember getting into this argument with a 
a D and D guy. Well, there's been a lot of arguments about that, hasn't there? You know, the old stormtroopers versus imperial armor versus whatever. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, um, the American role play games of the time that they're referring to were all Tolkien derivatives. They were very you know, high fantasy. Well, old Papa Tolkien came up with a hell of a lot of stuff. If you you know think about it, I mean, I know yeah. he took a lot of stuff from folk tales and the old kind of Irish pixies and things like this, but. He came up with pretty much the fundamental basis of most of our modern fantasy. Definitely, um, but you know, Games Workshop used to get a lot of flack because they say, "Oh, there's nothing original." But so, uh, I think we only have to look at Blooming Dreadnoughts really to see a fantastically original piece. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I'm a big Workshop fan, um, and for me, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, the first time I played that, that was the first real blood and guts and snot roleplay game. Mm. You know, it's really dark. It was, it was it German. Was, it was very bloody knuckles. Yeah, it was German in, in inspiration, wasn't it? Yeah, mm. that you know that Teutonic. Yeah, very much so. And um, it just it just wasn't high fantasy. It was an antidote. I mean, the the high fantasy stuff worked because of of the efforts of 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 of, of, of the adventure writers basically because they were very well. They did they lines. did very wisely, I think, use a community of story writers which made stories through Games Workshop and eventually through the Black Library, yeah. which supported and grew out the scope of their whole kind of army basis. And of course, people reading along were able to then purchase characters that they liked from their favourite stories to incorporate into their armies. I mean, I'm very much a fan of Gaunt and the Gaunt's Ghost series. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm quite. I'm quite interested personally in getting my getting a hold of my getting a hold of a nice little Gaunt's uh, Gaunt's Ghost set. Tanith, Tanith first, first and only. only. Yeah, I'm a I'm a Commissar Kane man through and through. Mm. Caiaphas Kane. Well, I've yet to read Caiaphas Kane, but Rob's very kindly bought me a book to read on it, so I'm looking forward to having to read through that. Unfortunately, much to Rob's dismay, he's going to find I'm what's known as a Bath Time reader, so his book is in grave peril. It's all right. You can have them. Oh, I've, I've, bless read, you. I've read the Caiaphas Kane about seven or eight times. You see, you see, dear listener, you're hearing Rob say that. However, the book arrived in pristine condition. It almost makes me cry to realise that I'm the person who's going to be reading it and doing un unmentionable things to it. I mean, Rob saw my Gaunt's Ghost second compendium volume. And I owned it for one week, and in that one week, coffee got spilt on it, and juice, and food. And I think it fell in the bathtub at least once. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's a shadow of its former self, and considering I paid £10 for it, what, about ten days ago? It, uh, it, it does look like a, a, a rain-soaked phone directory. <laughs> it, it looks awful. Rain-soaked yellow pages. So let's have a look at this. Okay, so this is um, the second round of highlighting, to exaggerate the... Um, the, the forms on, on the on the orc. Um, we're going to do one more on the face because the face is the, the natural focal point. It's nice how dry these, how quick these dry. To be honest, and then when you water them down, this is something that I always got really bummed out with when I was painting because I'd slap it on thick and it'd take ages to dry. And you couldn't do the next bit. Yeah. But with this style of painting, it's drying. You're moving on. You're getting the detail in. We're seeing a result. I mean, we're only what. One hour, ten minutes from having started with the basic black prime model, and already we can see a big difference in this. Yeah, it's uh, we've we've only got um, one more stage of of highlighting, which is going to be confined to the face. Okay. Okay, for the final round of highlights on the face, we're going to add a colour called bleach bone. Um, I prefer to use this than white because it's it's less harsh. I think you were saying it's slightly yellowy, didn't you? Yeah, it's it's. It's very good for highlighting. It's a very um, nice colour, actually, from what I'm seeing at the minute. It is. It's. Uh, I've just used the wrong brush there. That's oh, nice one. More yummy paint. Yum. It's. Uh, <laughs> it's. It's a really nice, creamy ivory white. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. I just add that. You see, I can imagine now painting a nice army of skeletons. Dip them in the pot one after the other on the lollipop stick. Don't try that. Okay, so this is the last highlight that's going to be confined to the face. Okay. And all we're going to be doing is just touching it over the planes of the face to give a bit of a bit of extra definition. Okay. And try not to.
I have to say, I mean, you know, the orcs really looking nice so far. I know you're saying it's quite a wobbly job, but 